just, you know, making some really stupid mistakes. And this book also brought up the topic of aging, of what it means to grow old. So this book, The Picture of Dorian Gray, is kind of like a, a combination of all those topics. It talks a little bit about disobeying authorities, a little bit about aging, or a lot about aging, and a lot about how society defines beauty. So I'm going to tell you the short summary of these first two chapters, and then each one of you is going to receive a sentence or a statement from these two chapters, and you're going to have two minutes to think about it, analyze it, and tell me what it means to you, okay? So when it's time to give you those statements, I'm going to give you time to write them down. You don't know who's going to get which statement, so I need you to think deeply. Okay, to those of you who just came in, nice to see you. Okay, the picture of Dorian Gray, the first two chapters, I hope at least one of you read the first two chapters. It's an interesting story, and it brings out three important characters. The first character is the painter, and his name was Basil something. The second character is Lord Henry, who is kind of like the, the, the person who has the controversial ideas. And the third character is uh, Dorian Gray. Uh, Dorian Gray is a young boy and he's extremely beautiful. Like imagine the most beautiful face, white face that you have ever seen, and that would be Dorian Gray. And he is so beautiful that people don't pay attention to his character or lack of character and only focus on his physical beauty. And that's how he comes in contact with this painter, this famous painter, Basil something, uh, because Basil invites Dorian to his house to paint him. He wants to make a portrait of him because the boy is so beautiful. So while Basil is painting Dorian, one of his friends, Sir Henry, shows up to visit. And Sir Henry is kind of like a very bad influence, like one of those people, and we all have friends like that, that's always going to come up with the idea that's going to get you in trouble. Well, that's Sir Henry. And so... Uh, while they're there at the house, uh, Basil, the painter, realizes that he does not want Dorian Gray to be friends with Sir Henry because Sir Henry is a bad influence. But it so happens that they become friends. So Basil is painting, finishing up the painting of Dorian Gray, and, we're, and Sir Henry, there's a time where they take a pause, and Sir Henry and Dorian start having a really strange conversation in which it's very clear to whoever's reading the book that uh, Dorian has nothing in the head. So it's a classical, very, very beautiful face and an empty head. And he is, uh, Sir Henry is just saying things and Dorian is just soaking up all the foolishness that Sir Henry is saying. When they go back inside the house, uh, Basil finishes the painting and they all start to look at it. Henry gets up and he says the painting is identical to uh, Dorian. Dorian doesn't want to look at the painting. And I'm going to read to you the part where he finally gets up and looks at the painting. It's all this drama. Okay, so pay attention to this because this might help you with the interpretation. You have to give me in a little while. Okay, so uh, uh, Mr. Gray, Dorian Gray, finally gets up and he looks at the painting. And he's extremely impressed by the beauty of the painting. And it says that the sense of his own beauty came on him like a revelation. He had never felt it before. Basil Hallward's compliments had seemed to him to be merely the charming exaggeration of friendship. Okay, what this means is that when Basil the painter used to tell him that he was beautiful, he thought Basil was just exaggerating. But now that he's seeing his face in the painting, he's realizing of how beautiful he really is. He had never, okay, uh, he had listened to them, laughed at them, forgotten them. They had not influenced his nature. Then had come Lord Henry Wotton with his strange panegyric of youth, his terrible warming of his brevity. That had stirred him at the time, and now, as he stood gazing at the shadow of his own loveliness, the full reality of the description flashed across him. Yes, there would be a day when his face would be wrinkled, his eyes would be dim and colorless, 
the grace of his figure broken and deformed, the scarlet would pass away from his lips and the gold steal from his hair. The life that was to make his soul would mar his body. He would become dreadful, hideous, and uncouth. Okay, what's happening to Dorian Gray? When he looks at the picture and contemplates his beauty, instead of being happy with what he sees, he starts falling into some sort of depression because he's looking at that and saying, one of these days I'm gonna be old and I'm gonna lose all this beauty, okay? Now this guy is probably late teens, early 20s. He has absolutely no reason to be thinking about getting wrinkled and getting old, but that's the first thing that comes to mind when he looks at his painting. Okay, but the, the drama gets even worse. So, this is what he says. After he looks at the painting, he starts to speak and he says, how sad it is. How sad it is. I shall grow old and horrible and dreadful, but this picture will remain always young. It will never be older than this particular day of June. If it were only the other way, if it were I who was to be always young and the picture that was to grow old, for that, for that, I would give everything. Yes, there is nothing in the whole world I would not give. I would give my soul for that. Okay, what's happening here? Common. And we're going to go back and go over some of these statements. The common belief that growing old is a bad thing. And that when you're old, you're so ugly and so decrepit and so useless that you should just die. That's what's happening to Dorian Gray. Once again, instead of looking at his portrait and feeling admiration and feeling happy, he is suddenly falling into depression because he's afraid that the picture is always going to look young and he's going to get old. And he says that he's willing to give you anything for that not to happen. So my first question to you, anybody who wants to answer, ladies and gentlemen, is if somebody came to you and said, what would you give me in exchange for eternal youth? What would you be willing to offer? What would you give away? What would you want to lose in exchange for eternal youth? To be young forever, what would you give? For instance, would you give your eyesight? Would you prefer to be, uh, lose your eyesight as long as you're young for the rest of your life? Would you lose your legs? Would you give an arm? Would you give your, Mother, what would you give in exchange for eternal youth? Who wants to go? Okay, Adrian has his hand up for a while. Tell me, Adrian. So, if you're gonna get eternal youth, why not give your youth? And if I give my youth for eternal youth, that will make me youth, but I wouldn't lose anything. So, if I have to, I would give my youth in order to get eternal youth. So. <laughs> Okay, you weren't really philosophical way, phew. <laughs> okay, who else has an opinion? Somebody else was speaking. Go ahead, Isabella. Um, honestly, I wouldn't uh, decide that. I would, I would say no, because, um, I mean, I know people think youth is... Uh, the best part of your life but what if that's not true it's not true because <laughs> when you're young you make the dumbest mistakes dumbest mistakes and then when you get to like 25 30 40 I will, what yeah i would prefer to to <laughs> grow and say no to that option Okay. Okay, one more person. What would you give in exchange for eternal youth? Or would you accept the offer? One question. Mm -hmm. Youth is the same as eternal life? No, youth is just juventud. I mean, you get to 100 years old and you still look whatever age you are now. So you're 17. So you can be- yes, but it's not the same? 17. It's not the same. No, because you could die at 100, but you die looking 17. One more person. 
Would you accept that offer? Even if you're, you age, you just keep looking whatever age you are right now. So my question to you then, ladies and gentlemen, is why is society so obsessed with youth? Let's not even get into the topic of beauty. We're going there. Why is society so, so obsessed with youth? I mean, they're always selling you products to look young, telling you how to dress to look young, telling you what to eat to look young, telling you what car to drive to look young. What is this obsession with youth? Who wants to try answering that? Me, 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 me. I think they have this idea that if we are in good conditions, I see, we are able to do a lot of things. For example, when we were talking about how people ignore old people, you know, and they think that old people cannot do anything because they are old and useless. So basically they think that being young and, you know, have a good health and, and everything, you can do a lot of things apart of making money but it's not true because if you're still young, there are going to be a lot of things that you wouldn't do. And first of all, there are people that have like traumas because something happened and you're still young, you know? There's a lot of things that can affect the way that you think about the work and the way you're working because people think that if you are young, you can work with you know, you can do anything, but no, when you have, I don't know, serve a world of head problems and feelings, you will not feel good about doing the things that you're supposed to love because you are capable of everything. I think <laughs> that's why society is so, you know. I agree with you. And one of the problems, one of the problems is that being young is wonderful, okay? Being young is wonderful. But there's one thing that's missing, and it's the wisdom that comes as you age. If you could be young forever, but have the wisdom of an older person who's had experience, then it would be perfect. But when you're young, for example, your age, you don't really have a lot of freedom. You still gotta do what somebody tells you to do, okay? You still depend on your parents. So your youth is good, and you might just move out and get a job and not be paid as much as you would because you don't have experience. So being young is wonderful, but there's something else that you're always going to be missing and that something else sometimes comes as you age. Now, I'm not saying that all old people are wise, okay? There are a lot of dumb old people. Let's start with our statements. First statement, if you want to write this down, do so because you're going to get one teacher minute to analyze it and you know teacher's minutes are short. <laughs> okay, now this is referring to uh, when uh, Basil is painting the portrait and Lord Henry is telling him that that portrait is going to be so good that every young man in England is going to want one. And this is what he says. You don't have to write the whole thing because I'm not dictating, just get the gist of it. A portrait like this would set you far above all the young men in England and make the old men quite jealous if old men are ever capable of any emotion. That's the part. So the question to you is, and you get one teacher's minute, what does he mean by saying if old men are ever capable of any emotion? Do you think he's right? Do you think old men are capable of emotions? Do you think old men would actually get uh, jealous by seeing the portrait of a younger man? You got one teacher's minute. Anybody gets to answer, but I am, of course, writing this down. Here's my notebook. Okay. So your minute is up. Who wants to give me a shot? Give, give that a shot. What is Maybe. he referring to? Go ahead. Um, talking about the way we grow up. When we are growing up, we become like 
I don't know, we have more information and things and uh, going through life, we discover that we can control our feelings. So yes, all men can have those certain things, feelings, but they know that they can uh, those, in those ways because it can, you know, like perjudicar have a negative effect uh-huh in them and that's why grown-ups and old people are capable of controlling their self okay it doesn't mean that when you're old and growing up you you stop having those feelings it's so stupid to think about that okay so anybody else one more person the statement is if old men are ever capable of any emotion, what would have given Lord Henry the impression that old men are incapable of having emotions? Go. Who wants to answer that? You know, you all got to say something at some point, you know. That's why you're in class. Okay, so who wants to give that a try? Do you think that's true, that old men don't have emotions? It's not true. Have you seen old men expressing emotions? They do have emotions. Mm -hmm. So that, uh -huh, go ahead. Um, um, the thing is that old men, according to the, the time they, they have lived, they know at least how I think, they know how to express the, the emotion. They're not just like, they don't know, they, they aren't like young people that sometimes they don't know what to do when they are feeling something new. Okay. Okay, so you agree with what Mandisa said that they can actually, they feel it, but they know how to control it. Yes. Okay, so let's go to the second statement. It says, but beauty, real beauty ends where an intellectual expression begins. I repeat, but beauty, real beauty ends where an intellectual expression begins. What do you understand by this? Real beauty ends where an intellectual expression begins. And you have one teacher's minute to analyze that and tell me. Beauty, real, but beauty, real beauty ends where an intellectual expression begins. Teacher, I have one kind of idea. About yeah, but you need, to let, you need to give the others a chance because everybody needs to get a little number. Okay, so wait. Come on, people. Well, I think that maybe he's referring to what real beauty means to the majority of people not what what beauty really means he's like referring to real beauty as if someone or the majority or uh, how i express this okay he's expressing the real beauty as the general definition of society have but not as how it is so when they say the real beauty ends when you have an intellectual expression is that when you have an intelligent expression, society don't see that as beauty or as beautiful as other things. And that's the difference, you know, maybe real beauty for society is something and the really real beauty for us is different because I think that beauty is a style, is what makes us have a different characteristic, have make us like a different style, make us different. Okay, good. 
Okay, he put on his hard hat. I don't Maybe know. Maybe he has some Wi-Fi problems. Who has Wi-Fi problems? Tennessee. Oh, oh, that's sad. Cableonda is no good. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is he really saying? What are you understanding? That, that was really good, uh, Mary Foster. Who wants to add to that? What is he really saying? He's saying that, tell me. So I had this um, thought about what she was saying and she said that society doesn't see real beauty as a thought or as an intellectual expression. And the definition of beauty is something that is pleasant or something that makes you feel good about yourself. So something as an expression or an intellectual uh, expression of somebody else doesn't give you any kind of pleasure or a pleasant feeling to yourself. So that's why it's not seen as, as beautiful as somebody with a pretty face, but no brain. Okay. Adrian, so what I'm understanding from what this says and what you're saying is that uh, Lord, Lord Henry was trying to say that you can't be beautiful and intelligent. They don't coexist. That as soon as you become intelligent, you get rid of beauty. Uh, Nesim, you wanted to say something? No? Okay. As soon as you become intelligent, as soon as you show intelligence, your beauty ends. So you cannot be both. That's what he's trying to express, which is, of, co of course, absolutely not true. Let's go to the next one. Um, the ugly and the stupid have the best of it in this world. The ugly and the stupid have the best of it in this world. You got a few seconds to analyze that. The ugly and the stupid have the best of it in this world. What is he talking about? The ugly and the stupid have the best of it in this world. Wait, Mandisa, let the others. There's a ton of people here just staring at their television or I don't know what they're looking at, but it's sure ain't looking at me. Come on, people, tell me. The ugly and the stupid have the best of it in this world. Who wants to give that a shot? Those of you who haven't participated yet because I haven't written down your name. Go ahead, Sarah. So I think that is almost the same as the... La frase anterior. Previous statement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's like almost the same because it's in this well in the world we live in today. It's actually true because all us. I mean, I'm gonna say it, I don't know if you agree, but all of this kind of dumb challenges and things are made by those. <laughs> Not ugly, but stupid people, and everybody just follows them, and they are successful because of that thing they made, and things like that. So, and, I mean, it's true. I don't know the part of ugly, but the part <laughs> of stupid, yes. Um, so, it is like that. So, I agree. Yeah. I agree with you, Sarah, and there's one thing that I have always told people, don't tag me in any challenges. I don't do challenges. I don't got time for that. But no, what, what he's saying here is that if you're ugly and stupid, you're actually happier than everybody else. Do you think this is true? Do you know ugly, stupid people who are happy? <laughs> Come on, one more person. Me. Go ahead, Mary. Hello, I can see your Hello. half of your face. Yeah, good. There you go. <laughs> okay, I think like some people think that being stupid make you more fun. 
oh. that if you are serious, you don't know how to have fun, or that if you are smart, you will be boring. Mm -hmm. And I think that mm -hmm. it's not true because we can be smart and be like happier and very. Uh, what is it? This is all? <laughs> you feel? Fun. You just said Funny. it like three times. Oh my goodness. So people, people, have you ever found yourself acting stupid just so somebody wouldn't judge you? Like you're like, okay, so for instance, you're in a math class or a physics class and it's hard and everybody's pulling out their hair and you know all the answers but you're not going to speak up because you don't want them to think that you think you know more than them. So you just stay quiet. Has that ever happened to you? Uh -uh. Tell the truth. Hmm. Okay, let's go to the, Mandisa, what did you want to say? Because I see you popping there. Go, go ahead before we do the next one. Okay, it's about that, that, it's a, it's a, y que testamento. Testamento? Okay, so yeah. I was, I'm watching sometimes like people reacting to La Rosa de Guadalupe and when you say those, those sentences, it reminds me of the stereotype that they always put in this stupid novela that smart people with glasses are the smartest and are the dumbest and losers. So that means that people that are brilliant and with glasses because to them, people with glasses are ugly. They are capable, but they are ugly. So it means that pe beautiful people are more capable, but these kind of people are more capable of doing something else like maybe technology. And they think that that is people that are stupid and ugly. And that's made me so mad. And more when they say that people with glasses are ugly. I want to punch those people that think that people with glasses are ugly. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's go on to the other phrase. The other phrase says, I have grown to love secrecy. It seems to be the one thing that can make modern life mysterious or marvelous to us. I have grown to love secrecy. Secrecy means keeping secrets. It seems to be the one thing that can make modern life mysterious or marvelous to us. Tell me what you get from that. That secrecy seems to be the one thing that makes life more mysterious and marvelous. Do you agree with that? Keeping secrets makes life more wonderful. Do you agree? Yes. Let other people speak, Mandisa. Okay, what about those of you who are silent? There's this, there's Soto, there's La Yali, there's, well, Isabella, I can only see one eye, but she's participated. There's Daniel, there's a uh, Dayan, there's, oh my goodness, I'm forgetting these people's names. Well, the rest of you, talk. Ah, Amir, and Rebecca, and Moises, and Nesim, and, the girl with the pretty hair and Hennessy's. Talk. Can you repeat this statement? Okay, the statement is, that's why you need to write this stuff down. I have grown to love secrecy. It seems to be the one thing that can make modern life mysterious or marvelous to us. Meaning that keeping secrets makes life wonderful. What's your opinion? I wouldn't say wonderful, Mm -hmm. But it do brings um, like that feeling of wanting to know what's happening because <laughs> the this I mean secrets are the there I don't know how to explain it. Okay, let me let me think how to explain it and I'll say it. <laughs> okay. So people what are why she thinks what are some secrets that you have to keep? 
Because, you know, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because the, we live in this age of social media where people put everything online. What I'm eating, I went to the toilet, I'm going to wear this, I bought this, I'm going here. Everything is just out there. Okay, so what type of, of, of information do you think should be kept secret? Uh, you know, this thing with the pictures of the plate of food, wow, you know, some people post that every single day. I mean, I don't really care what you're eating, but you know, people feel the need to inform the entire universe that they had some broccoli for lunch. So are there certain things that you should keep secret to make your life more wonderful? And if so, what type of things should you keep secret? I think that if someone tells you a secret, you should don't tell anyone what he told you. Okay. Snakes. When you kill someone, <laughs> Oh my goodness, Mary Lou, thank you. So yeah, when you kill someone, definitely keep that a secret. <laughs> what, are, what are other things you could keep secret? For instance, your relationship. Should you post on social media all day, every day, pictures, te amo mi bebe, mi or should you keep your relationship secret? I think that we could say to our parents, or our family, or person that are close to us, not like, uh, to strangers publish publish all our photos in Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or on all those uh, social media. Yes, because if you tell us to someone that is a stranger, maybe he will start to meter <laughs> him and Gossip. things like that. Gossip relationship. Yeah. Okay, what about how much money you make on your job? Should that be a secret or should you just tell everybody, oh, I'm making this amount of money, yay, I'm rich. Or should that be secret? A secret. Okay, so now let's go back to Isabella. Did you get your thoughts? Yes. Tell me. Uh, the secrets bring the mysterious that make you curious. Mm. Uh, mm. So, I don't, I wouldn't say it will make life wonderful, but maybe it will do it interesting. Yeah. Yeah, because if people don't know every single thing about you, you're actually more interesting than if people know everything, every single thing that you ate during the week. That's like, after a few minutes, it gets boring. Okay, next one. The one charm of marriage is that it makes a life of deception absolutely necessary for both parties. And by parties, it means both persons. The one charm of marriage, charm is encanto, the one charm of marriage is that it makes a life of deception absolutely necessary for both parties. Okay, the one thing that's actually charming about marriage is that both persons live a life of deception and deception here doesn't mean deception deception means mentira i think that he has been through some marriages and they have failed because that's an opinion that someone that has been divorced would have well you have to realize <coughs> that this book was written in 1840 so at that time, what were some of the reasons why people got married back in those in that century? A baby. <laughs> <laughs> no. Social <laughs> status. Uh huh. Uh, societal status. It was all about the money. It was all about oh, you know, he can make me upgrade in society. So it wasn't really about love or falling in love. And so that's what you need to realize. So when he's making this statement that the charm of marriage is that it makes a life of deception absolutely necessary for both parties, he's coming from that culture and that society of the time. So, so tell me, what does this mean? One more person. Kike? Oh my goodness. One more time. The one charm of marriage is that it makes a life of deception absolutely necessary for both parties. Give me your opinion. I already had one opinion, I need another one. 
Is it true that marriage makes a life of deception necessary for both persons involved? From what you've seen, of course, none of you are married, but from what you've seen of marriages, of how marriages work, what do you think? Is it really based on a lot of lies or can you have an honest marriage? Yes, I think you can have an honest marriage. And I think now in these days, you can, you have the opportunity in those back in those days you have to stick to the rules because of your parents and the and your par partner's parents and you have to stick with the feeling maybe when you were in love with other i'm like oh my god I'm, I'm screwed because i am in love with other one and i did something to him or something and now i'm getting married to a stranger just because my parents need the money and the and the reputation and in those in those states a lot there was a lot of affairs you know but now we see a lot of affairs too so you know there was more secrets but it can be a lot of secrets now and then because we are human and that's what humans are supposed so then, to do like what they're telling me is that it's it's true that marriage involves some level of deceptions Yes. Okay. Let's go to the next one because our time is running out. And the next one is about influence. Okay. Now we live in an age of influencers and everybody's an influencer and everybody has followers. And so this is, this is a statement. All influence is immoral from the scientific point of view because it becomes an echo of someone else's music. All influence is immoral from the scientific point of view because it becomes an echo of someone else's music what do you think what does an influencer do let's start with that what what, what exactly is, is an influencer it tells people and a, let the other people participate the rest of you daniel jerry's nesim rebecca Natalie, Genesis, wake up. Eduardo, you too, wake up. Eduardo's right beside me. I can pinch him. Wake up, people. Tell me, what, what is an influencer? Basically, it's like to follow the leader or do what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So do you agree that all influence is immoral because it's just like one person echoing another person's music? Yeah. Yeah. And that's I the problem. I agree with that. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And that's the problem, you say? Mm-hmm. Well, I lost my idea. Sorry. <laughs> Anybody else wants to talk about influencers? Before we go to the last statement. Yes, Aranza. Yes, you haven't spoken either. Go. I think that it depends on how does that person uses that influence. Mm. Because I hear a lot, I hear a lot that um, some influencers that I follow say that it, it's important how they manage this thing of the influence that they have on people. Because it could be good or it could be bad. Mm -hmm. You could influence somebody to, for example, como, how, how could I say invadir? Invade. <laughs> Invade the Area 51. <laughs> what is that? Or, yes, there was a movement that they want. In the United States, that a lot of people want to go and invade the Area 51. I don't know. People is crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or you could influence people to, you know, like in these times, to use your mask, to wash your hands, to take care of people and all of that. So it, it depends on how to use your influence. Okay. For me? Yes. Oh, yeah. Good influences are good and everything. But it, it's the same act. You're rowing 
rolling with the same, with the influence. It's the act. I'm I'm talking about the act. Mm -hmm. Getting involved with influences. Mm -hmm. They might be good or they might be bad, but you are flowing with influences. It's not bad, but yeah, it's good to run along. Yeah, I think what Eduardo is saying is that is the problem with the, the followers. You have a problem with the followers. The people who just, everything the influencer says or does, they're going to imitate it. I think that's, that's, that's your real issue. Yeah. Okay, next statement. Uh, the last one. The only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it. The only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it. Uh, yield means to ceder, to give, up, give yourself over to it. Tell me about that. The only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it. And he goes on to say that if you resist it, you're going to want it more. So the best thing to do is you have a temptation, just go with it. And that's it. Okay. Talk to me, teenagers, because if your parents, if you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend and your parents tell you, I forbid you to be with that person, what do you do? Do you obey your parents or do you find ways to sneak out of the house to go see that person? Tell me, be honest. Those of you who haven't spoken, let's go with Daniel. Come on, tell me. Do you agree with this statement? The only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it? Um, can we be the the only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it. I think that I... Mm, and Natalie, you're next. Okay, go ahead. That I'm not agree with that. You don't agree with that. Why not? Because, for example, if a, people have, a person has a temptation to kill someone, <laughs> it's, it's not necessary to kill the people, the person, to feel like free of that temptation. <laughs> Good one. Good one. And Natalie? Well, for me, it would be like a hard decision. Mm -hmm. From one part, um, leaving that person will uh, avoid you problems with your parents and those things but from the other part if you want if you like someone mm -hmm. uh, i think no one can uh, like um, obligarte force you uh -huh. no one can force you to to like stop loving that person if you love someone you you can say a anything to that person, but that 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 is not going to avoid you to love someone. Okay, so for those of you who haven't participated, which are Rebecca and Genesis and Nesim and Je Jeris, Dayan, I have one last one for you, and we're through. It says, "Youth is the only thing worth having." When I find, this is, this is uh, Dorian Gray speaking, when I find that I am growing old, I shall kill myself. Uh, when one loses one's good looks, whatever they may be, one loses everything. What do you think of that? Is it true? When you lose your good looks, you lose everything? Let's go, Jerry's. Of course not, because when we lose youth, okay, we our faith will not be pretty, of course. Or maybe, yeah, for example, Jennifer Lopez, she's pretty cute, a oh, gorgeous woman. But intelligence and what we have been learning all the years will stay. Okay, Rebecca, what do you think of this statement that um, when I find that I am growing old, I shall kill myself. What's your opinion of that? This was um, by Dorian Gray. Okay. Um, I think that um, if you take like your appearance, like the most important thing in your life, 
maybe you should do it because <laughs> you know it's it's kind of your whole life and you're only interested in that that's one of the the um, the points that you say in the first statements like the ugly and the stupid and the dumb you know is like uh, they are not like um, interest in in search for happy things because they are dumb <laughs> they, they don't think anything so they are kind of like you know they they are not searching for for that so if you are uh, cute or I don't know you are intelligent you are always searching for those things that you know that you don't have so if the only thing that you love or are interested in is about your beauty and you lose it I mean yeah you should do it because <laughs> okay so we're gonna leave the rest of you for next class because it's 47 minutes already you wanted to say something Nesim, are you going to wait the next class? Me, yeah, teacher. Genesis. Um, I was going to say that I don't agree that if you are old, you're going to lose everything. Because as Diane says, mm, the most important thing is that what you have inside. Like your abilities, your personality. And if someone just wants you because of your outside part, I think it's better if you leave that person. So. Okay, people, yeah, you have an assignment you need to turn in, which is the definition of beauty, among other things. I need you to turn that in. I know some of you already gave it. I have listened to some of you. I haven't graded anybody yet, but you need to do that. I need you to be able to tell me in your own, from your own perspective, what is your definition of beauty uh, based on the guidelines that I gave you in the outline. Everybody do that homework. Do not start skipping homework from now. This trimester is very short for some of you, and some of you really need this trimester to be a good one, okay? So see you next time. If you have the opportunity, please, please, please read chapters three and four. The book is really interesting. Okay, bye-bye.